If you, uh, we have membership and baptism classes available to start. If you haven't been baptized and wish to do so in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, let us know. And uh, we'll get a class started for you. If you wish to, and you are baptized and wish to become a member, you are not a member, uh, see me. See uh, Pastor C. Richard Torres back there. And we'll get a class started for you. It is good to belong to this church, to be a member, to make decisions for this church. Be a part of this church, make this church your church. It belongs to God, but also make it yours. Also, we do have until uh, that is, what's the date, brother? Next week, right? Next Sunday. Uh, I, I think it's running to the end of March. To the end of March, if you have any clothing, good clothing you, you wish to get rid of and donate to homeless people, our brother Jesus, you can he'll raise your hand, please, brother. This is Jesus, and, and you can bring it to him, and he will take it out there to, for the homeless people to use. And you know, especially with this kind of weather, jackets, sweaters, things like that, you know, that, you know, are, are good for them, but you no longer use. They're taking up room in your closet. You have it in storage? Get out of storage. Give it away. All righty. Next, we don't forget uh, this coming Friday, March 8th, we're going to have uh, funeral services for Leonard's dad. Uh, will be held at Rose Hill Cemetery at the um, the Sky. Oh, you can't read. Sky Rose Chapel. Can't read my own writing there. So it is at 11 a.m. for those that wish to attend. Again, Brother Leonard, Sandy, our condolences to you and your families. Next week, also, uh, don't forget, guess what's happening? You're all going to be happy. We're going to lose an hour. Daylight savings time. So at 2 a.m. on Sunday, uh, March the 10th, at 2 a.m., it's going to be 3 a.m. So please make sure that you move your clocks. If you have your phones, your phones automatically uh, do that, but your, your house clocks probably will not. So that way you don't come an hour late here for service. And then we want to encourage you all to vote. Your votes are important. Try to be as aware you can of all the issues going on, who's running for this office or that office, and vote. Your vote does make a difference. Okay? Well, that's the extent of our announcements. May God bless you all. Well, good morning. Praise the Lord. Are you waving to me, Alma? Yes. I want to remind the congregation to remember to donate money for the youth camp. As much as you can and when you can. All right. Thank you, Alma. And it's so good to see our brother Daniel here. Daniel, praise the Lord. He is a walking miracle. Amen. And our other Daniel right here, praise the Lord. Amen. So good to have both of you here. Praise God. All right. Open your Bibles, please, to 2 Peter chapter 3. We are going to conclude 2 Peter this morning. A few uh, months back, we started in the general epistles, and we did James, 1 Peter, today we'll get done with 2 Peter, and then we're going to move on to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Jude. That is the general epistles. <clears throat> we're not racing through, it's been, it's been a while, but 2nd Peter chapter 3. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your 
your miraculous deliverance of Daniel, who had a very severe heart attack, and he's with us today. And for the other Daniel, Lord, that had a stroke, and he's with us today. You are a good God, and we thank you for answering the many prayers for deliverance for these two very special men. Thank you for them being with us. And we pray now that you would help us to focus our thoughts, our attention on your word. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Chapter 3 deals with the second coming of Christ. He came the first time, amen? Yes. 2,000 years ago. He's coming again. Amen. He's coming again. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is now, beloved, a second letter. What, what, what was the first letter? First Peter. first Peter. This is now the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand. We have two thoughts here. There is a need for reminder. And there is a need to remember. The reason why Peter writes a second letter is because they needed reminding. You see, even sincere believers need reminding. That's what he says right here. Stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Even sincere Christians need to be reminded. And they need to remember. That's verse 2. So we need to be reminded and we need to remember because we're forgetful. What do we need to remember? Well, verse 2. That you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets. That's the Old Testament. And the commandment of the Lord, Je the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So you've got the Old Testament and you've got the New Testament. that we are to remember. You've got the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. That's the Word of God. That's the Word of God that we are to remember. The Scriptures, very important. Very important. Look at chapter, uh, actually chapter 3, verse 15 regarding the two divisions of the Bible. Chapter 3, verse 15. This is Peter writing, and he says, And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as, just as also our beloved brother Paul. So Peter is referencing Paul, both apostles. But this is interesting. Just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. So Peter is aware of Paul's writing. As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. Peter says some of what Paul writes is hard to understand. So when you're reading Paul's writings, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, etc., when you're reading those writings and you're having a hard time understanding, 
Peter's with you. Peter said, sometimes it's hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures. So Peter is talking about Paul and equating Paul's writings with the rest of the scriptures, the Old Testament. Peter is saying that Paul is as authoritative as the Old Testament. So that is what we have to remember in verse 2. Now, so we need to remember the return of Christ because we forget that. We live our lives as if he's never going to come back. He hasn't come back in 2,000 years. He's probably not going to come back in our lifetime. So I'm not going to worry about it. And we forget that he is going to return. Now some people mock. That's our second point. Mocking the return of Christ. Verse 3. Knowing this first of all. That in the last days. Mockers will come with their mocking. Following after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? He's not coming back. You're always talking about his coming. Where is the promise of his coming? People mock the return of Christ. Now the extent of their mocking. <clears throat> know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come. In, their, in the last days. Now that is a technical phrase there, last days. What is that referring to? Well, that is referring to the last days are from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. And all of its subsequent happenings, the millennium, the great white throne judgment. The, so from the first coming of Christ, to the second coming are the last days. So we are living in the last days. We're living in the last days. And it says that in the last days, mockers will come. So the time that we are living in is characterized by a lot of mocking. Don't be surprised. Now, what is, the true, what is the true reason for the mockery? Look at verse 3. Mockers will come following after their own lusts. Their own lusts. Men want to be free to pursue lustful, lustful pleasure without consequences. Unafraid of divine retribution. Retribution. I can't say words right now. Retribution. Men want to be free to do their thing. So they have to get rid of God. And they have to get rid of Christ. And in their minds they mock the second coming. Because if he's not coming back. You can do whatever you want to do. You can follow your own lusts and do whatever you want to do. So the rationale for mockery is, uh, the true reason for mockery is men following their own lusts. Now, the rationale for true, the rationale for the mockery. Stay, now stay with it. It gets a little bit complicated here. These people, verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, ever since Abraham, Isaac, Jacob died, all continues just as it was from the foundation of creation. Nothing ever changes. Seasons come and seasons go and all continues on just as it has always been. Now, when you talk about the return of Christ, it is accompanied by cataclysmic events. 
natural upheavals. You read the book of Revelation. And these mockers say it's never going to happen because it never has happened. Christ is not returning like the Old Testament speaks about with all the natural calamities that are involved with that. All the cataclysmic events involved with that. It's not going to happen because it's never happened in the past. All continues the way it's always been predictively. Predictively. There's nothing dramatic that's ever going to happen. Thus, they mock the doctrine of the second coming. Now, so the rationale behind the mockery is lack of catastrophic events. You still with me? Okay. But another rationale is willful ignorance. Verse 5. For when they maintain this, when the mockers maintain that things have always been the way they are, nothing dramatic has ever happened since the beginning of creation. Everything has been the way it is. Thus, Christ is not going to return with all of the dramatic things accompanied uh, by His return. Verse 5. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice. Conveniently, they forget. They forget. What do they forget? It escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Things have not always gone on the way they have, the way that, that they are. There was a time when something catastrophic took place on this planet. It was a worldwide flood, and they conveniently escape their notice that things have not always been as they are. There was a time when God intervened and invaded this earth and destroyed it with a worldwide flood. They forget Genesis 6 through 8 speak about a worldwide flood. They, they, their ignorance of Scripture causes them to believe that everything has always been the way it is. God did intervene. They show their ignorance of the Scriptures because they forget that God did invade this world in judgment. And they're also ignorant of geological and fossil evidence. When you study geology, when you observe this earth, the earth cries out and says something catastrophic, something violent, something destructive happened on this planet. Something violent happened here. And you have the evidence all around. You have, you have, you have uh, mountains rising up from the ground. You have valleys gouged out. Evidence of a worldwide flood. So the mockers that say everything continues on as it's always been since the beginning of creation forget that thousands of years ago there was a worldwide flood where God intervened and He cleansed this planet by a flood. Fossil evidence. Why are there fossils? Why are there ocean 
see fossils in the deserts, in the deserts around us, or in the mountains. Because there was a worldwide flood. The scripture attests to it, and nature attests to it, that God intervened. God intervened. And he's going to do it again at the second coming. That's what it says right here. Verse 7, But by his word, the present heavens and the earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up since all these things are to be destroyed in this way. What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. God destroyed the world once with water. He's going to do it a second time with fire. With fire. So this brings us to the third point. Fearing the return of Christ. Fearing the return of Christ. If you are not a believer, you should fear. And we just read those verses. It's going to be fearful. But for now, we are living in an age of grace. The delay of the return of Christ. He hasn't come back yet. Verse 8. He hasn't come back. Obviously, He said he was coming back, and we know he is, but he hasn't yet. Verse 8, there's been a delay. Why? But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. That with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like one day. So, since Christ walked this earth, it's only been two days. Because with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. And a, th a thousand years for us is quite a bit. It's a long period of time. But we are dealing with a, go with a God of eternity. So it seems like a long time that he has not come back, but it really hasn't. It's been a couple days. The Lord views time differently than you and I. He's not in a hurry. He operates by a different timetable. So don't grow impatient. Now, there's another reason why he hasn't come back yet. Had he come back 20 years ago, most of us would have been unsaved. Right? Most of us... How, how many of you have been saved for 20 years? Raise your hand. All right. Most of you have not. Had he come back in 1980, most of you would have not been saved. So why hasn't he come back yet? Verse 9, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. He's not slow. He's patient. He's not slow about his promise. He's patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He hasn't come back yet because he is patiently waiting for you to come to repentance and be saved. 
That is why he hasn't come back yet. He hasn't come back yet because you're, you've got some unsaved family members. And you kind of, you want them to come back, but you're kind of saying, Lord, can you wait just a little bit longer? Maybe you've got some unsaved kids that aren't saved. And you're praying that they get saved. And they, they, they will get saved, but it's, it's not now. Well, the Lord is patiently waiting. That's what it says. He's not slow about His promise, but is patient towards you. Not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. The delay of His return. Now, the motivation in light of the return of Christ, how are we to live? It gets practical. In light of his return, how are we to live? Verse 13. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what we're looking for. We're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We are grieved by all the unrighteousness we see around us. We are grieved. And it's easy to become bitter and to become jaded. All the various politicians are all promising to do the same thing we've heard about for years. They're all going to fight for you. They're all going to fight for the working man. It's got a broken record. And part of our jaded mind says, yeah, right. But you don't, don't let me discourage you. Get out there and vote. Do the best you can. We're, we're, uh, we live in a society and we've got to vote. But we know that it's all putting a band-aid on a major wound. We are looking for a new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And that's not going to come until Christ comes back. But now, because we're looking toward that, how are we to live now? Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things... Be diligent to be found by him in peace. When he comes, are you going to be fighting? Are you going to be squabbling? Are you going to be quarreling? Are you going to be battling people? People in your family and people in your, in your sphere of influence? Or are you going to be peaceful? Be found by him in peace. Be peaceful. Spotless. And blameless, be pure. Spotless and blameless. Verse 15. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Have gratitude, live with gratitude. Lord, thank you for your patience because I know that that makes salvation possible to those that aren't saved. Regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. People misinterpret the patience of God. They, they interpret the patience of the Lord as He's powerless, or He's forgotten, or He's never going to come back. No, regard it as salvation. Verse 17, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled and fall, unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. In light of the second coming of Christ, live with vigilance. Vigilant, be on guard. Don't be carried away by the error 
of unprincipled men, liars, deceivers, mockers. Don't follow them. Don't be carried away. Vigilance, steadfastness. Don't fall from your own steadfastness. Be firm. Be stable. Be steadfast. Don't be movable. Don't be gullible. Be steadfast in your convictions and what you believe. And then, but grow, verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is your Lord and Savior. Grow. To Him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. How did it end? Amen. Amen. Motivation in light of the return of Christ. Live with purity, live with gratitude, live with vi vigilance, and live with growth. Are you growing? It says right there, but grow. It's not a suggestion, it's a commandment. Are you growing? Or are you regressing? Are you regressing? Are you going back? Are you growing forward? Are you growing deeper? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you know more about God now than you did last year? Are you growing? Ask yourself, am I stunted? Am I regressing or am I growing? Growing. Because if you don't continue to grow, then the root, like a plant, if a plant doesn't grow, and you've got to prune it so that the roots stay healthy. But if the plant never grows, the roots start to rot. And you've got to pull it out and throw it away. You've got to grow. That's the motivation in light of the return of Christ, to grow. So the whole third chapter here deals with, in some capacity, the second coming of Christ. He's coming again, and there are mockers that say, no, he's not going to come because everything has been the same. Nothing has ever changed. There's nothing dramatic that has taken place in this earth since creation. They've conveniently forgotten about what? The the what? Flood. God did intervene in judgment. He's going to do it again at the second coming. He's going to destroy this earth by fire. And then he's going to create a new earth. That's where we're going to live in eternity. New heavens and new earth. So because he's coming back again, embrace those motivations right there. To the glory of God. Amen? All right, we are going to move on to our communion. So we're going to open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11, 23. <clears throat> when you're there, say amen. amen. Praise God. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, 
which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we hold the little bread in our hands, we are to remember that it symbolizes the body of Christ that physically died on the cross 2,000 years ago for your sins and mine. He died to pay the penalty for sin, to satisfy the wrath of God, to make it possible for you to be forgiven by dying on the cross. He died so that you can live. And as we partake of the bread, remember that powerful symbolism. He died for you so that you could live for him. Brother Richard Torres, can you pray for the bread at this time? Father, we just thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Where we should have been paying for that price, he paid for it, Lord. He made it possible for us to enter into your throne room, Father, in behalf of so that we can ask for forgiveness. And yet, Lord God, he still lives at your right hand, he sits. And we thank you, Father, that we can glory in our salvation, that we can give you thanks every day, Lord, for the day you give us until you call us home. And we thank you for that. And in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Richard. Shall we eat as one body in Christ? Scriptures can continue in verse 25. In the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The cup symbolizes the blood of Christ. He shed his precious blood. He gave his life. He died for our sins. So the bread and the cup basically both symbolize the death of Christ. And we need to, as Second Peter said, always remember. Be reminded. That's why we do this once a month, because we want to be reminded that we are Christian people. We are saved because Jesus Christ shed his blood and died on the cross for us. Amen. Who deserved to die? We did. I didn't hear you. Who deserved to die? We did. Who, did, who died in our place? Christ, Jesus Christ. Because of that, he's our Lord and Savior. Brother Raw, can you pray for the cup at this time? Father, we thank you for your grace and for your love which was shown in Jesus Christ, our Lord. When he hung on the cross, Lord, and his blood dripped on the cross, taking the punishment of sin on our behalf, we thank you, Lord, for such a great sacrifice. And Father, now uh, we are united, Lord, and take communion service so that we, Lord, would be joined with him, Lord, in his death, that we would look forward to being raised again to newness of life, Lord, and eternal life with you. We thank you for the sacrifice in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we drink as one body in Christ? Huh? 
Amen. At this time, we'd like to invite our ushers forward as we give our tithes and offerings, as we worship the Lord with our giving. We praise God for the faithfulness of God's people on this corner, allowing the work to continue on from year to year. Praise the Lord for you and your generosity and faithfulness. I don't know if you're aware, but there are different ways to give. Some people give on the plates here, or you can give electronically through Tithely or what's that other thing we have? Square. Square in the back over there. Camille has a square device and um, something else. I forget what it is. PayPal. PayPal. So you can do it that way. All right, let's bow in prayer. Father, we pray that you would bless this morning's offering. We pray that it would be sufficient for the needs of the ministry here. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people, Lord, over these many years that have continued to invest in eternity by giving. And we thank you now and pray you would bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.